And we are live on Carolina Poets. This is Poetry Goes Live with Carolina Poets. We are a bi-monthly series hosted on the Carolina Poets Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. We're here the second and fourth Thursdays of each month, except for special months like thanks, like uh, November when we just have one reading in November. Um, I'm your host, Andrew Clark. I'd like to thank my co-curator, Kimberly Sims Gibbs, who hopes, helps to curate and host this series. For our series, we've been fortunate enough to have readers such as North Carolina Poet Laureate Jackie Shelton Green, Ashley Jones, who was recently named Alabama Poet Laureate, Ray McManus, Tyree Day, Nicole Brown, Jacinta White, a whole host of other poets have joined us. If you've missed any of our readings, don't worry. They're archived on our Facebook page and on the YouTube channel. So uh, you can always go back and check out any of those uh, prior readings. So for each reading, we feature three poets with connections to the Carolinas and beyond. If you're watching this broadcast and you have a book coming out or you're a Carolina poet that we've not featured yet, uh, we'd like to hear from you. We do feature established poets as well as emerging voices. While we're letting a few people get on, I have a little, little series I call What is Andrew Reading? So Andrew is currently reading Ghost in a Black Girl's Throat by Kalisa Ray. And Kalisa actually did read for us um, last, I guess it was in the spring. So I just want to read one of her poems which is uh, particularly, I think, they're a great collection overall. They're all great, but this one is called Horticulture. My father stems from a long line of green thumbs, dirty fingered men skilled at burial and denial, men with hands gentle enough to plant, firm enough to dig, tender enough to praise, tender enough to prune, sturdy enough to pack earth around the necks of buds. It is a calculated craft to bury seeds beneath the earth at the proper depth, to examine the soil and extract weeds from the root, to create life and food with bare hands. This is how he learned to parent, push seeds down beneath the surface, drown them in water, forget them, suffocate with calloused hands and expect the sun to reach the shadow places he hid them. So once again, that poem is Horticulture by Kalisa Ray from her collection, Ghost in a Black Girl's Throat. And I think this is, yeah, Red Hen Press. So definitely, definitely check that out. So tonight we're, uh, we're very excited to have three fantastic poets join us. We'll hear from Al Black, John Persley, and Sam Barbie. Um, we ask that if you have any questions for our poets, you go ahead and and write those in the comments below this podcast. We see the comments from Facebook and YouTube. So go ahead and ask any questions you have for our poets. I'm going to go ahead and introduce at this time Al Black, who will be our first reader. If you haven't heard Al read, you're in for a treat. So Al is a Hoosier in the land of cotton. He writes poetry and hosts workshops and arts events in the Midlands of South Carolina. He is the author of two books of poetry, I Only Left for Tea, which is fantastic, a great collection. And also his uh, second collection is uh, Man with Two Shadows from Muddy Ford Press. He's a co-editor of Hand in Hand, and uh, he also was part of Poets Respond to Race. That's from 2017, Muddy Ford Press. And he co-founded the Poets Respond to Race Initiative. And he co-hosts the Chewing the Gristle Poetry Chat YouTube series. I think he co-hosts that with Tim Conroy. And he was the 2017 Jasper Literary Artist of the Year. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the stage Mr. Al Black. Al, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's uh, The weather here has been beautiful. Um, well, we're, we're very excited to have you. Thank you. Um, uh, so that I don't overdo my time, I'll get started right away. With COVID, I'll read some from my books and some, some stuff that's not published. But with COVID, I find a lot of folks have either become very attached to their pets or have adopted pets. And, and this poem was in response to a, a friend on Facebook whose pet was dying. 
It's called To a Friend with a Dying Pet. I would tell you about a free kitten given to us when we were poor. It got leukemia. Cost us all kinds of money we didn't have, and the damn cat died anyway. But you don't want to hear about our expensive free cat. So I won't tell you how, even though it was sick, it snuggled and purred in our arms, and that somehow, even in its pain, it still brought us joy. I think poetry responds to who we are, and we, we have to tell our story. William St Stafford would say it's more important to, to tell your story in quantity than in quality. Um, and a lot of his stuff had a, had excellent quality as well. But um, I'll start from there. This one's unpublished yet. It's called Maybe. Once we were junkies and drunks, stoners, hustlers, and pimps, training trading bodies for dimes. If I forgive you your trespasses, maybe you will find a way to forgive yourself. And if you forgive me my trespasses, maybe I will find a way to forgive myself. And if we both are forgiven, maybe we will heal. And maybe the kingdom will come. A Monday morning poem. You gave at church, at home, on the playground, at team practice, in fights after school. You gave in the back seat, the drunken party, at the office, and for a worthy cause. You stole kisses, hearts, and candy. You stole time again and again and again. You threw it away. You disbelieved. You tried to die, and no matter where you turn, your soul says, I am still here. Uh, I'm doing a number of very short poems. This is called Dream Number 1103. I have enough dream poems for a chat book. Dream number 1,103. One night, you dreamed the moon had fled, stars stayed, and cast your shadow on a wall. You followed your shadow to a gate, but the gate was locked. They placed a blindfold over your eyes. You stood against the wall. They fired a volley, but it was only your shadow they shot. You abandoned your shadow and fled, chasing the sun. Odysseus's dog. When I return home, will you remember my voice? The rhythm of my walk? my scent on beggar's clothes. Help me bar the door so I, I, so I may draw my bow and slay the young men who believe I had lost my quarrel with the gods. I'm going to read a couple poems from my first book, I Only Left for Tea. <clears throat> when I was nine, I am the positive one. I have coffee with friends. I listen. I give them hope. I help them go on living. Later, alone, over cold coffee, I read Anne Sexton. She sees beneath my smile she laughs at my pious faithfulness. 
she sticks her fingers in her genitalia. I lick her fingers and taste her depression. We lie naked. I tell her my dreams, the ones where I chase the man in the shiny car who threw me in the grass by the road. Go home, little boy. Your mother is calling. I want to catch him and kill the man statistics say I may become. I am the positive one. I have coffee with friends. I listen. I give them hope. I help them go on living. I pick the grass from their hair. I say, tell me your story, for mine is too much to bear. And this is <clears throat> a poem for a friend of mine, for two friends of mine, actually, who were going through hard times and in the process of breaking up a relationship, which probably never should have happened or should have been broken up years before. This is called Daughter of Light. Daughter of Light, you have slept through your alarm. The sun is filtering through curtains hung a lifetime ago. You must leave his warm bed. No turning back. But how do you tell someone you must leave if they only know their own voice when what you must say can only be said in the language of your dreams? Let your emotions lie in shredded heaps upon the floor of the house of your visitation. Walk away quickly, clad only by the sun, Leave only your bare footprints in the dew of his front yard. There's a lot happening <clears throat> in the news. And a lot of it has to do with scared, scared white males who are scared of minorities and scared of women having their power. And so I've been writing a whole series about Madonna or Mary figures, women who want to birth or have birthed a God child, whether in myth or in history or in scripture. This first poem is called Concrete Mary. Concrete Mary. Against the chill of morning, I put on shoes and a warm jacket. Robins and sparrows, scavenged seeds, call back and forth from fence to ground. Squirrels in fur coats don't mind autumn's approach in high grass. A lone cricket chirps along the fence. Unafraid of the old man with an empty coffee cup, four city deer snort and graze on overgrown shrubs. Seven days remain of summer, one week, a quarter moon, before earth tilts away, before solstice chases the sun. As if she knows a secret she cannot tell, concrete Mary smiles her Mona Lisa smile practices yoga on the wall, and holds a sauna pose. Mary, when did you become holy? Was it when they pulled you from the mold, loaded the truck, took you to a garden shop, tagged, sold, and someone took you home? Or was it the act of setting you on a wall where lichen took root, Pulled substance from air. How many tenets have you known? Do you know movers come on Wednesday? Sun peers through overcast skies. 
warms Mary's plaster gown. Outstretched hands gather light. Her face becomes a moon. Chipmunk chatters, plastic owl roosting on a patio wall. Red birdhouse in neighbor's yard sits empty, waiting for spring. Rain comes, drips from fingers. Concrete Mary holds her pose. Somewhere, Joseph holds a baby so nothing disturbs her peace. Rain comes, drips from fingertips, puddles at feet. She holds the pose she struck when she became an Italian citizen and awaits her son's reanimation. <clears throat> this poem from the same series is called Talking with Mary. She said she walks to church in each morning, but does not go to mass. She said she likes can lights candles for all of her children ice took away. She said she talks with a statue of Mary and Mary talks back. She said she avoids confession and the man behind the screen. She said she once threw holy water on a nun, hoping she would melt. She said she dreamed of become, she said she dreamed of becoming a virgin again, but not to become holy or pure. She said she wanted to be a virgin so men wouldn't think they own her. She said she wished she could take her children back to hold them to her breast. She said she talks with the statue of Mary and Mary talks back. Mary said she likes lowing cattle, angels singing in the night, the smell of sheep, dirt, and the sweat of Joseph. Mary said she was made into a concrete statue so she couldn't run away to a quaint country village for an anniversary weekend. Mary said she's thankful for the three strangers at her door, the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Mary said she used their gifts to bribe the border guards and keep her baby at her breast. She said she talks to Mary and Mary cried. This is another poem about a different type of God child. It's called Meditation on the 50th Anniversary of the Moon Landing. On my neighbor's black and white TV, I watched the final conquest of the moon, just her grandson and I and an old deck of cards. We cut the deck again and again, playing flinch until we beat our arms black and blue. After a giant step was taken and a flag unfurled, claiming it for earth people, the man in the moon fled and we went out the back door. We climbed a neighbor's fence, went to Kroger's, shoplifted fudgies and ice cream drumsticks, ate them, and left our trash on the curb. A few years later, on spring break with a friend, I stayed in an ashram in the West Virginia mountains. I was writing paper for a religion class and was given free roam of the grounds. The young woman who prayed, fed, and bathed the statue of Krishna told me how based on this life, I may become, uh, I may come back as a moon creature. I replied that 
we have been to the moon and there is no life on the moon. You have to have moon eyes to see moon creatures, she told me. I told her that didn't make sense. She told me to believe in miracles and they will happen. She said, one day while lost in prayer, the statue of Krishna came alive, kissed her cheek, removed her robe, held her breast into his lips and asked her to bear his child. A sound at the door returned Krishna to blue plaster, but she believes that if she remains detached and holy, she will bear a godchild, and she hopes he is blue like his father, luminous as the sky around the moon at noon. This morning, I think of sore arms, a giant step, stolen ice cream, a young woman who believed in miracles and wonder if she ever had her godchild, the color of the sky around the moon at noon. I did an apraxic event recently uh, at the Orangeburg County Arts Center. An apraxic event is where you look at pieces of art and you write poems using that piece of art as a prompt. And I wrote this <clears throat> poem to an ink drawing on mulberry paper called Why Me? The, the artwork was by Una Kim, who's a Korean artist based on the West Coast. I named the, the uh, poem Praying to the Patriarchs. Threadbare dress, sinew and bone, calloused feet on ground, hands in air. I have four kids. Don't call me lazy. I work three jobs. None pay a living wage. I'm not your incubator to impregnate and leave. I make ends that have no end meet. Pay me a living wage. Give me my rights. Mary chose her plight. Why not me? I'm going to read two more short poems. These are from the book published in 2018 uh, that I wrote after my father passed away. The artwork is by the singer, songwriter, and visual artist uh, Chris Coolidge. And it's edited by Ed Madden from Muddy Ford Press. <clears throat> if you know anything about the South, especially low country, they paint the ceilings on porches and uh, window trims this light blue. And it's called haint blue because what they say is this blue will keep out or scare away ghosts, which is a haint, because the haints will think it's the sky and not a house. So I wrote this poem for my father. It's called Haint Blue. You carried the birdcage out onto the porch, hung it from the hook above the rose bushes that hugged the steps that led down into the yard. Hot coffee steamed in your hand. A green chameleon appeared in the bushes, jumped to the rail and raced up the po post. Slowly, it changed color and disappeared in the bright blue ceiling of the porch. You unlatched the door of the cage. The bird stared out at the fields beyond the yard. For a moment, it sat on the wire edge of freedom, unsure how to leave. Wings opened 
and it was gone. You sipped the last cold coffee in the bottom of your cup, knew that when winter comes, you will miss the bird that sat caged in the corner of your living. You leaned back in the chair, stare up and searched for the lizard that hides in the blue, blue ceiling sky. This is my last poem. It's a short one. It's called Enough. Because you won't live long enough to fly in a rocket ship to the nearest star, you won't need to understand eternity and infinity. It is enough to know that you are here, that you have today, that this is all you've been asked to handle. And that's okay. I want to thank Carolina Poets, Andrew Clark, Kimberly, for allowing me to read. Al, thank you. Those poems were very powerful. I really like that ekphrastic poem. I want to see that one on the page. So can you hang out for us? We're going to have a brief Q&A at the end. Are you available for that? Oh, yes. Great. Okay, we'll see you in a few minutes, okay? Thank you. So uh, welcome to Carolina Poets. Poetry goes live if you're just joining us. I did want to give us give you guys kind of a quick um, commercial for November 11th. So we're actually going to have something different for Carolina Poets on November 11th. I'm going to try to uh, show this if I can. So at this point, I want to go ahead and introduce our next poet. Uh, uh, our next poet is John Persley. John teaches contemporary literature and poetry at Clemson University, where he also directs the annual Clemson Literary Festival. He's the author of a poetry collection, uh, If You Have Ghosts, from Zone 3 Press, as well as the chapbooks, A Story Without Poverty, uh, the South Carolina Poetry Initiative, and A Conventional Weather which was from New Michigan Press, among others. In addition, he works as the poetry editor of Burnside Review and is an assistant editor for the South Carolina Review. His poems and reviews have appeared in Poetry, AGNI, Colorado Review, The Kenyon Review, and elsewhere. With that, I'd like to welcome to the stage John Persley. John, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Good, good. Thank you for joining us. Looking forward to your reading. Most definitely. I thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. And it was really lovely hearing Al read um, before me. Um, one of the, uh, um, I'm not really sure what I'm reading. I've got kind of got a slew of stuff here, but uh, I, th I actually think I'm going to read an older poem to start off. For some reason, I just felt like it. Um, and I, I think I'll start with a, uh, an older poem, which was the title poem to one of my chapbooks called A Conventional Weather. I haven't read it in a really long time. Um, but I was thinking about it today because I was somebody was annoying me and uh, I had a neighbor who once really, really annoyed me. And so I sort of imagined a life for her, um, which made me feel more fond of her. Anyway, without further ado, a conventional weather. The water in the bath has stilled and there is a silence about the room, which she will not rise to. Though he is gone again and she is alone. The busted bicycle still leans against the tool sheds. Handlebars rusted the color of clay, though not enough to suggest that this is Alabama, to say nothing of the coming night, the distance between our homes, the hollow pitch of gravel against the wheel wells as he pulls away, none of which would console or cure us. We are absolved of nothing, abstain from nothing. 
exchange few words, speak when spoken to. Everyone is lonesome. It's all right, you can say it here. You can say it and not want to believe, but it isn't in the demarcations, the camisoles like curtains drawn tight about the body that we cover our nakedness. It isn't in the gardenia votive she's lit or in the two cut iris she'll leave too long in the window. The little things my grandmother would say, the creature comforts, which are only enough to know what isn't there, which is him, which is everything. Self-conscious as we are to watch and be watched, to speak for those who don't acknowledge us or wish to be acknowledged. These things too will pass. What she remembers folded flat, pressed in origami doves, the improvised hand of a father fumbling to find what he cannot say, as if to stop time or take back a name. The rogue coffee and cigarettes lithe upon the throat and rising what she remembers as from a great height, the rush and whir, the scatter of pigeons through the window, window <clears throat> which by now must hold the heat of his coffee, the heaviness of voice, the single pebble of sand which beveled the glass to a point of weakness, the rush and whir, the pigeons he'd imagined to be doves taking flight, lifting just then up and out, the air around his head darkening, the sky changing shape all at once. Had she been older, she might have comforted him. She might have cradled his neck against her own and held him there in the affectionate posture of a mother, or at least have turned to look at him. As it was, she did not and continued sweeping, each stroke issuing against the tile, a sound like expensive tape paper being torn from the backs of old books no one cared to read and which a fire kindling ignited easily in a way so habitual it seemed less a duty of childhood than a childish attempt not to succumb to the slow assimilation of time. The cold partitions, chimeras, between what is real and what we come to believe, because the story never changes once the wheels are set to motion. And death, as in all stories, takes its center and consecrates a beginning. There is no unending, no asters or tulips for cars to pass and grant their shape. Such is the way of windows, of gravity and rock, conventional weather. The truth is the water is warmer than she would like. And between here and there, it is mostly wasted space, an empty driveway that no one uses a 50-year-old pecan tree that produces no fruit, dropping dry limbs at the mere suggestion of rain. Mostly there is quiet in the absence of quiet, an occasional car in passing or mockingbird among bamboo. Mostly we do not speak. And the truth is at this distance, distance, I can see only enough to know that she has drawn a bath and if anything, appears disinterested, lost in a light above her head, in the soft dissonance of that music. It is a language strange to her, as if spoken too quickly from an airport payphone, a terminal busy with passengers, boarding and unboarding. So many voices, the almost indiscernible screams of children, of tires touching down, of rubber, and steel, the quick click of a woman in heels is now slowing, now passing away. The luggage wheels and the wheels of stroller, strollers whirling at dirt, whirring at dirt and dust, the microfibers of a boy's brown coat being dragged across the floor. And a woman is crying in the arms of her mother a girl too big to be carried drops a lollipop and on impact, exploding in a confusion of ruby shards. It sounds, in fact, more exquisite than it is. And though the child seems not to care and more than a little bored by it, 
For a moment, all sound stops. The escalator jams, the striders and laggards alike. Then nothing, only a man clearing the tunnel from LaGuardia to Newark, scanning the room, his thick wool suit too warm for the weather, working his way toward the arms of his wife, who's prepared dinner with candles, salmon sautéed in fresh chilies and limes, her hands rife with vinegar and a low-cost lotion, the fragrance of tea trees, her arms extended as if she were swimming, and then nothing, only the awkwardness of reunion, the sweet smell of candy, and water, water everywhere. Kind of a happy start, but uh, that's kind of what I do. Um, so that's an older poem, um, but I, I, I don't know, for some reason I, I never read old poems, like kind of when I get done with them, I sort of move on to something else. So I'm going to read some poems from my new manuscript that I'm kind of putting together, and I'm just going to kind of read without explaining much about them. Um, but they're pretty big poems, as you can tell. Um, I'll try to space it out and give us some shorter ones here in between. So here's a shorter one. It begins with a branch, then disaster and disenchantment. It begins with a branch, then disaster and disenchantment. The sprawl, a sprawl of water rolling up over the deck, the tomb of Christ, the dead reckoning by sun and by stars, the diffident bird unaccustomed to sea, the miles of kelp of sargassum extending north like a top with no bottom, like star grass, the elongated stalk like mastic trees overburdened with fruit. It begins with the real and imagined fears. The ice congealed about the hole and St. Amador's ship held fast. Where would you walk if you could walk top with no bottom away? Oh, Captain, it begins with a woodcut of monsters at sea, the myth of the two-dimensional world dismissed, exchanged for purgatory, Life, liberty, the pursuit of, it begins with a fractured sky and a star falling through, a cross stave, the eventual astrolabe. It begins with the nascent science of navigation, the top mass of a 120 ton vessel, splintered adrift at sea. It begins with salt and wine, molasses and honey, dried meats, biscuits and fruits. It begins with a branch, a small boy in the crow's nest, clearing his throat with nothing to say. So yes, I'm writing these really big poems, sort of loosely, uh, sort of in the American mythos, Columbus. Uh, so it's, it's, these are my Columbus poems. Happy Columbus Day. Um, that's a joke, uh, sort of. <laughs> that's as close to a joke as I get, I think, probably most of the time. Um, Here's the, the first poem that I wrote for it, actually. Um, it's called In the Back Pages of This Boy's Life. And I sort of was punning on the uh, fact that as a child, I got uh, Boy's Life magazine. Uh, probably some of you are aware of that. I don't even know if it, it still exists, but uh, I think it was a Boy Scout magazine. Uh, um, and I uh, loved it as a kid. I, I, I fancied myself a, a man of the woods. Uh, so in the back pages of this boy's life, in the back pages of this boy's life, a few stray ads and dedications, an opportunity for blue sky congested with the traffic of clouds. My parents, for instance, who never understood my infatuation for trinkets, the switchblade combs and compasses, the BB guns made to look like German Lugers and Remington Prairie rifles, Saturday night specials kids could carry for the rest of their lives. And why not? The SDs rocketeers are rifling toilet paper tubes at the moon, their payloads packed with living cargo, a praying mantis, June bugs and Japanese beetles, little dagamas and cooks, cartiers ready to raise the white flag, break bread and start staking their claims. And with little or no say in the matters of home, what would you expect a child to do? Even our own government shows no shame, pilfering our inside secrets behind x-ray glasses, 
their invisible inks and whoopee cushions, like so many exploding cigarettes. Just walk away. Is that your answer? Please, doctor. In the dream, it is always the same. I am climbing rung over rung toward what must be the center of my life, afraid to look down, to let go, my mother standing over a table arranging the petals of a flower I cannot name, though my father, his pencil etching out the mistakes in the morning crossword, most certainly could and would were he speaking to me and not to my mother, who isn't listening. There is a postcard on the table, an ashtray, and a book about birds my mother never tires of reading. Outside, the night settles into medicinal dark on the backs of baying cattle, on trains carrying livestock and coal into the heart of a city which offers nothing, if not the vagaries of transient living. The queer trundle of cars, clearing the beam bridge, then the viaducts and north, like the wolves the local farm kids took pot shots at. Rumor was they killed cattle, descended in packs upon the herd, giving chase to the weaker ones, usually calves, the older milk cows which stumbling break the bones of a fetlock or knee and cannot run. Mostly you wouldn't notice them at night against a darker stand of trees, and until early evening they didn't exist at all. And then, only slowly, and from the south, and after my father has picked his pencil off the table and has begun writing again, something about trains, his propensity for trains, their dilapidated wind whistles, and that rhythm of wheels rolling over itself, and even then you might not see one, in the wild, standing against this small ridge of untouched timber, like a sentinel, checking passports at the gatehouse unflinching, indifferent, to even the nervousness of those passengers he'll flag for f further search or seizure, the tiny revolutions of the turnstiles facilitating something like hope, or so I'd once believed. In the end, it is a story without poverty, and whatever died stayed dead, or lies bleeding in the tall grass and fescue, listening to the quiet, cheering the cricket's wings against a night so full of stars, even the most obvious constellations appear inaccessible. The highways were, the cattle cars, cars crossing, recrossing, the beam bridge, just another kind of silence groping towards the morning, like song, an aria with no beginning and no foreseeable end just the rough weight of a body as it retreats and falls, as it retreats and falls and cannot rise. I was gonna read something else, but I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish with this one, um, which is, uh, one second, stacking everything on top of the phones I'm gonna read. Don't work so well for me. Um, Al got me thinking about uh, Mary. So I, ha I have a little mention of Mary in one of my poems um, as well. As I mentioned before, this longer work that I'm working on centers on Christopher Columbus. I'll read this one quick and uh, uh, pass the torch along. Um, it's called, if, if this is the elegy for the fallen, if this is the elegy for the fallen St. Christopher. If this is the elegy for the fallen St. Christopher, if this is the face for which a thousand ships will be launched, if this is that launch and the face of that launch bears a similarity to Mary Magdalene and not the Mary fried into the side of a grilled cheese sandwich that never grows mold. If this is any Jenny, Beatrice or Beatrice or Beatrice, if this is what is led, left at the bottom of a leaden box in Santa Domingo, by way of Valladolid and Seville, Santa Domingo, Havana, and another plausible stop in Seville, and a small silver tablet engraved with the last parts of the remains of the first Admiral Don Cristobal Colon, the discoverer, is unearthed in an otherwise unmarked tomb. 
If this is a spiraling outward, tunneling inward toward the source of that prayer, if prayer is more than the order of words, as Eliot says, and our course holds true, if we specify our demands and embrace this animal of the body the way Jonah embraced the whale for three days, three nights, as water rose around him, swilling about his ankles, knees, and nose, believing he would die. If our only two stories are a man goes on a journey or a stranger comes to town and death is imminent in each, if this is our reservation and the ca casino never closes, if tonight's cocktails are on the house and we can drink enough to hold it down, and down implies direction to or in a state of activity, if Isabella descends, if Oviedo and Fernando Colon, if the history is correct, and Atlantis is more than an eyesore of bad city planning. If the Santa Maria holds true, if God wills it and the wind is right, if this is an outlet, the exit, a door, if we can bomb them all back to the Stone Age and start all over again and still keep their wallets. If this is the lead shot of an unnatural death, if Hispaniola, if Navidad, if you can say it five times fast while rubbing your stomach and patting your head and still stand up, if the Spanish monarchs refuse to stand down. If I could submit, for example, the Toscanelli letter, June 25, 1474, as exhibit A and outline the voyages of Marco Polo. If this is a tale that begins with an unknown pilot, some sailor caught in a storm shipwrecked in the supposed new world. And if, a big if, he is able to return from there. If there are geographical coordinate points, and in his dying breath, he passes them on. If these are the arms where he expired, if this is the last clear narrative of the modern world, and wherever you are is half a world away. If the Taino refuse a fight, if this is the first of the final two poems to be read before introducing tonight's poet, if we can balance the boy child upon our backs, if the burden is not too much, if this is the wheel that never advances and the past recedes with each unmarked day, if this is not a malioration, but posits our direction, if the ultimate restitution of one, of all, is the ever blessed one, then yes, I guess so. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Thank you, uh, um, Sam, who's going to read next. Um, thank you, Kimberly, and to Andrew and Carolina Poets. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, John. I, I really like these Mary poems. We had kind of a little bit of a theme and some Christopher Columbus <laughs> there, too. So really enjoyed those. Can you stick around for some questions after the end of the reading? Most definitely. All right. Fantastic. All right, so I apologize. It looks like we lost audio a few minutes ago. I was trying to um, just make a quick advertisement for um, the reading on November 11th. So I put up the banner, but when I do that, apparently I lose the sound. So um, I, I won't do that again. So uh, on November 11th, we, we have kind of a special reading and I'm worried for some reason, I'm not sure why that's happening. We'll fix that. Um, but we have a special reading on November 11th when Carolina Poets goes fiction. So we're going to have Jason Mott, authors Jason Mott, Maris Lawyer, and Taylor Brown, three fantastic uh, po uh, fiction writers with connections to the Carolinas. And so make sure and march, mark your calendars for November 11th for that reading. Uh, it's our first ever fiction reading, and we're going to plan to do that each November. So with that, I'd like to bring our next reader to the stage, and uh, our next reader is Sam Barbie. Sam's poems have appeared in Poetry South, Literary Yard, Asheville Poetry Review, and Adelaide Literary Magazine, among others, plus online journals such as American Diversity Report, Exquisite Pandemic, Verse Virtual, The Voices Project, and Medusa's Kitchen. He has a new collection, Uncommon Book of Prayer, and that's from Main Street, Main Street Rag Press in 2021. And um, his previous poetry collection, The Rain We Needed, what came out in 2016 from Press 53. He was a nominee for the Roanoke Chowan uh, Award as one of the North Carolina's best poetry collections of 2016. He received the 59th Poet Laureate Award from the North Carolina Poetry Society for his poem, The Blood Watch, and is a Pushcart nominee. So his new collection is, I don't know if you can see it, but it's the Uncommon Book of Prayer. And he hopefully will, he will read some, some poems from that. So with that, I bring to the stage Mr. Sam Barbie. Hey, Sam, how are you? 
I think you might be muted. Can you unmute yourself? Try again. Okay, we can't quite hear you. Um, not yet. I'm going to drop you out and, and try to bring you back on and see if that works. How about now, Sam? No, I can't. I can't hear you. I want to make sure we have sound. Um, otherwise, uh, other readers are giving me a thumbs up. They can hear me. Um, let's see. Any luck? Can you hear me, Sam? You can hear me. We, we just can't hear you. Uh, maybe check your mic settings just in case. Okay. How about now? Well, I uh, can't, can't quite hear you. Uh, maybe we'll give you a second to troubleshoot. I may bring John and Al back and do a few questions if we have any, and then we'll come back to you. Is that okay? All right, Al and John. Um, so, Al, um, just ask you a quick question. I don't see anything in the chat yet, um, but tell me about, you talked a little bit about writing during the pandemic. Can you tell me a little bit about that? <clears throat> well, I I retired about three years ago, as I told you before the show, and um, I'm a very social creature. And all of a sudden, COVID shut down everything I did. I would do about 30, 30 to 40 readings a year. Plus, I hosted about 100 events a year. Uh, one was a weekly show and then four monthly shows. And so for me, being an, an, an extreme extrovert, COVID was like savage change. Right. And uh, we live on a corner across from a little park with a pond and, and a dense woods. And so I often come uh, and often get up and take coffee and go over to the pond at sunup and watch the sun. And then from what comes from there, I write. So in many ways... Um, it changed my writing because my writing was more about my my inner self and right. what I was hearing and seeing as opposed to writing from meeting people and hearing their stories and who they are. So in that regard, it changed a lot of things. Um, yeah, you know, I think uh, we, we sort of, uh, being poets, we get pegged as being introverts, but I'm kind of like you, like I sort of feed off the energy of others. I want, that's one reason I like hosting this series and meeting people. Uh, I like to be going to readings as much as possible. So for, for me, it was a similar type of thing. And then for a while, my company had me working from home, so I wasn't getting you know that interaction as well. Um, Sam, I want to try your sound again. Are you working? Uh, you tell me. Yes, you are. You are. So we're going to do what we're going to do is we're going to backtrack and bring Sam up. You guys stay on deck if you don't mind for a few minutes for questions. And we're going to uh, go ahead and let Mr. Sam do his thing. OK. So well, delighted to have you. Well, I'm I'm glad to finally be here. Sorry for the hold up. Um, enjoyed Al and John's readings quite a bit. Um, as uh, Andrew mentioned, I have a new collection, the Uncommon Book of Prayer. And uh, it's a selection of poems that we I started when my family and I went to, over to England. I had a friend at Oxford at uh, studying at Eton with, and his he and his family lived there. And we went over and spent two or three weeks there. So this is really just a journal. I've kept a journal all the way through the travels, and uh, these are just poems that all emerged from that. Familiar surroundings. A basin of water revives me. 
In my friend's apartment lie scattered stacks of Le Mans newspapers, German classics, biographies of composers, Mozart strings untie the morning air. Cappuccino with breakfast, we partake pastries and scones from the neighborhood market, each baked in as we slept in. And there is a corner ph pharmacy, bus riding, qualified car mechanics, loud neighbors are cordial. England and all her histories, stone towers and colleges, Celtic crosses, lush meadows across countryside in view. We ride a bus, walk to and from. I will strive to balance the antiquity with fresh views and vistas, inhale it and blend it day by day. At home, our paper arrives, but I do not read it. Own Mozart quartets, but do not play them. Could grind my coffee, yet do not. Children glide about cobblestones, accept new routines, overcome their jet lag. Do not reminisce asphalt, dismiss white noise of TV. This morning I shuffle Mon Ami Le Monde, add Kahlua to my coffee, a similar twist to Sunday mornings across the sea. We, we didn't really have a, uh, a list of things that we wanted to visit, and uh, we just kind of made up day trips. And but one thing that we did was at the top of our list um, each day was Stonehenge, of course. And we were there in uh, right before the solstice, two days before the Druids got there and uh, and did their thing. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an awesome place. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, the uh, Salisbury Plain, which is a long distance. When the sun rises on the solstice, the sun shines on the, ar the altar inside the rings of stone. Borders, Stonehenge. Distance dotted with sheep and Guernsey, veils and streams and plumes of trees, a checkerboard of pasture and heather, lilac and rapeseed await harvest. From horizon to forever, the Salisbury Plain convinces there is no reason to rush. It provides the view that never recedes and allows dusk lush cushion for sleep. Stonehenge broods on the smooth ridge, silent summons, prehistoric peal to worship among the three rings, across Barrow, beneath summer solstice sky. Welch stones erect for the short night. Lentils bridge one monolith to another. From a hinted millennium of pastoral odyssey, perfect circle toppled, but right unbroken. Adjacent fields host lambs, chasing ewes across the meadow. A farmer leans against his bale wagon. His children wade through deep grass toward unsheared sheep singing to the sacred ring's slaughter stone. Here the perished wake in blood beside the path, lily blooms along the swale. Within hedgerows, arterial vines replenish gnawed stubble and gird the acres for new seasons. Collies herd the Guernseys through a stream while I splash while a splash of clouds immerses into nightfall, ushering visitors through the cedar gate on breadth of stone's late shadow. A tradesman trims the briar, slashes an unruly virgin thorn. And since we had our kids, our kids were nine years old and seven years old. This, is, this has been a work that's been going for 20 years. Just now that I've retired, I've, I've just decided to pull some things out. Uh, when we did travel and stay overnight, we stayed in uh, B&Bs, and this is one that was uh, in Branscombe called Whole Mill Inn. By eventide, star crawls the horizon at Branscombe by the sea. Miles into the valley waits Whole Mill Inn, a Tudor cottage, ivy-supporting stone walls 
and roses prop banisters around a slate veranda. A stream spins a water wheel. Our host informs me we have a fox out there. He filched the rooster. Our children rollick and with white geese and downy chicks tumble into a pond. The gander drags himself over dew to protect them, hip failing him, wingspan still wide, but the proprietor picks him up and pins him. Good old fellow, gets stuck in the flowers, makes a mess of them, you know. Downstream eel and trout cut water, my children brave the bog, mud to their ankles and pluck glowworms and newts. I kneel on grass beside the gander to witness his world from a granite stoop. He honks to summon his flock, and they return to his domain. Lilacs and geraniums nodding as slugs emerge onto stones. I call out as children venture into the bramble. Moon powders the garden. Um... We went uh, to the castles, as you would imagine, and um, we were able to go to some of the sites. Uh, one was was in Bath at the the underground the bath the underground baths in Bath, um, and this is a story or this is a poem that uh, is about uh, the growth of my son or the beginning of the growth for my son. Levels. Those Romans did things right. Bath proves it. Boiling underground spring adapted to a spa, complete with Turkish baths and saunas, fit for fat senators and their legions of young men, submerged under mud for centuries, built over, rediscovered by chance. My son moves about on his own through relics and ruins, explores different levels, stone chambers with fluted columns, a Celtic gorgon, smiling down, private bathing pool enjoyed by centurions, the Victorian elite, monks from the abbey. Different eras reveal rings stained with iron and sulfur. My child moves far ahead, peers across the green pool into a different archway, looking perfect among bleach statues, chestnut hair sun-glossed. I wave, his palms flash to me for a moment, foretell this new season when devotion and independence must mingle. He moves through the hot bath, cold bath, touring his student, his warrior, asserting his philosophy. I let him go and reminisce straight taking strolls, my arm on his shoulder, and bath times, immersing him as muscle bloomed, definition taking hold. Uh, the last one in the book, and then I'll read from another, uh, British Isles, um, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Locks and Lofts, Isle of Wight, of Man, United, a land of islands, of tides, realm of Jersey, Guernsey. I read Dunn's laments, how she cuddles stupid calm, proves a rotten state, or Kipling's ifing imperialism to prove the sun never sets on the empire. Sorry, sirs, but I am content as a man about your island. Celebrated kingdom, blessed with random bounties, my wife and clutch of children found your chapels and gardens as delights on these enchanted shores. The me, the us, balance my world as your islets enliven your ragged, raging continent, christen, christened when flogged by gales, humbled and blunted by surges, aflame with prayers as beacons and corners, chapels and crags. A previous collection, That Rain We Needed, was pretty much autobiographical. I grew up in Wilmington, just up the coast from Low Country. And um, I was adopted as a child, as a baby. Uh, and this is where it, my story, I suppose, began. Tent. 
My mother dyed her hair. I was adopted that next day, processed, approved by all, made to order with dad's red hair. Saturday nights, I watched her bend above a basin, soaking red tints into gray, rinsing away the lack of 50s perfection. Dad displayed me to friends and family, a boy to teach all he knew. She rocked me through twilight with lullabies, making me her own. Their first child had died, born blue and silent. Number two was sponged away. Determined to improvise, my mother dyed her hair, immersing each strand in auburn tints, hoping to look the part. As I grew, teenage pastimes replaced her. My father discovered electric trains or took me fishing. Through attrition, we abandoned her. The gambit fell apart, leaving another shadow to cradle. Her hair found truer color. Toward the end, strokes and strikeouts paled her prayers. I wrapped myself in the quilt she never started. It's my orphan's life began again. And another, um, this is uh, from our frequent visits to my grandparents after my grandmother, first grand grandparent had passed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Twin beds. I revered their chamber. It, it's frost in winter. It's frost in summer bright strength in winter. My grandparents slept there, his gold pocket watch on the bureau, her red bonnet on the chair. But after Jemima died, all seasons, all holidays came and went. He gave up on the room's comforts. One summer visit, it was decided I would sleep in his honey's bed, the first to unmake the crisp linens and printed gingham spread. In sparse wattage of a bedside lamp, he rubbed himself with curious liquids from brown bottles. His spearmint and vanilla pierced my prayers. Twilight sprinkled the bedroom shears. Night breeze wavered webs of curtain lace. I witnessed his confessions. And somewhere in the midnight pitch, I lost myself between shadows of the, on the plaster ceiling. At dawn, Granddad ventured out to the garden. I remade her bed and straightened his bottles, making sure each cork was snug. Andrew, I forgot to start my my clock with everything else. If you just need, just give me a nudge when I need to when I my twenty minutes is up. Sorry. Let's see here. Armed forces, I guess, as in nine eleven. Everyone knew where they were the day that Kennedy was shot. I was in the fourth fourth grade at the time. It was Thanksgiving holidays. Armed forces. NBC blared, Kennedy is dead. I was out of school, Thanksgiving holidays, turkey legs and stuffing. Not much traffic. Not the usual neighbors walking. My dad sat on the back steps and worked up enough saliva to expel a bloody paste onto the ground. Curse this hurt. The dentist had yanked his final incisors. All his teeth had withered from suffering fevers from malaria and diphtheria in North Africa. You know, the president was a veteran, just like me, both battling the Axis. He had hard evidence, black and white snapshots of pyramids, the Sphinx, bare-breasted native girls, elephants, staff sergeant on the motor pool that drove Rommel from the dunes, the victory story. Hope they hang that son of a bitch. Then he motioned for me to come close. Son, little fella shouldn't say grown-up words like that, okay? I nodded and I hugged him. His body stiffened. You're a good boy. I just hope that'll be enough. Curse this hurt. His stale cigarette breath made me gasp. He spit again, bloody pace curdling in the dust. Curse this hurt. The night snug in bed, 
That night, snug in bed, the television still buzzed. My lips silently formed the new phrase, son of a bitch, into the wrinkles of my white pillow. What not, what's not left? Hands clasp the tube rose can after she has heard me. The snuff's pungent scent spills off her breath. She picks at dollies, protecting her upholst upholstered chairs, threadbed arms, and answers my question, a tissue dabbing corners of her lips. All things must leave you one day. Even her lemon yellow canary, like his emerald mate a season ago. Weeping may stay the night, but joy comes in the morning. Past the empty hanging cage, she motions out the window and explains the pair are together there in some bird heaven, tending one another, exalting in a persimmon tree in a grove near a calm lake where old fishermen offer them skewered gills of their catch and toss the long day's leftover worms onto the shore. Let's see. Sorry to be so unprofessional here and not be ready. A little later in the book, uh, last section, it arcs into me as a parent and uh, some of the things that we go through. Keeping a journal. This house, still and creaking from the cold, hosts much more than wishes. At my desk, I prepare all manner of mourning, sifting notes, clip to more notes, I uncover a photograph of a Mexican father flanked by a wife and a grave digger. In mist, the, they process up a hill on a cobblestone lane fronted by stucco cottages and shops. Porches lean and cover sleeping hounds. His son's small coffin strapped across his shoulders. The father wears his Sunday hat, struggling with the new balance. He repeats answers he can not pass on to his boy. I study veins in my palm, switching places with his father. One hand hold my daughter, the other his broken mother. Could I muster grace to stake Easter flowers on his grave? For now, I race my son to maturity, to the first fine hair on his chin, to that handsome grin the day I notice he is worldly being there each day to help him solve his moments. I vow to jot only the positive word, sidestep tragic matters, take the high road. For today I press the book cover tight, the photo sealed between random pages, and creep through the shadowed house. Avoiding hollows poised to corrupt, accepting which victories I must live without. And I'll stop on this one. A um, little bit lighter nature. Uh, I think most of you of my generation will recognize most of these references in it. And uh, well, many of you will understand how the uh, familiarity of marriage uh, has its effect. Lost frequency. I heard Hendrix Rampage and the Bliss of Blues Buzz by Cream. George Harrison's twang, they're strapped on fender solid bodies of a hollow white Gibson that liberated John Lennon's anthems. Through it all, I clamped headphones tight to never miss a distorted note, sealing out that parental contorted rote, turn it down. From a back seat, I heard the back beat of and crank Pat Pete Townsend on a Stratocaster or the Funkadelics on a Ghetto Blaster. That's 60s music, the hard kind, the first love. Rocks me awake now, each grown-up sun up, as your role did once each night. As if holding the unflexing whammy bar, your dexterous fingers wah-wah my midnights into resolute slumber. 
but these days my listening has been lessened. Intimate frequencies fallen mute. Our modulations fewer and further between. I hum each, I hum each chorus with fading fervor while your notes reverb in my refrain. As earbuds drown out ambient throb, I am left with only fretful melody, each tone beckoning my trembling timber, yet knowing one day the ranges within reach shall fall tone deaf too. Done. <laughs> Sam, I think uh, ending with a Hendrix poem and mentioning <laughs> funkadelic, like I know automatically you're my people. It's, you don't even need the post the Beatles posters in the background. That tells me too. But um, I'm going to bring the rest of the poets in. And I thank you very much for sticking with us, even though you had some technical difficulties, because sometimes people give up and put you in and we're able to really, really enjoy that. We did have a couple of questions from uh, the, the viewers. So I wanted to throw those out to the group. So the first one was, what are you guys reading? And uh, if you want, if you want, we'll start with John. Is it, can you tell us kind of what you're reading right now? Uh, yeah, I'm reading uh, Dennis Smith right now. Um, I'm, I started reading their work, uh, I guess, uh, a couple of years ago. I taught it today, so. Oh, nice. So it's nice. very fresh with me. I'm also reading, uh, I should say this for what it's worth. It's, I know she's a fiction writer, but uh, you know, I'm the director of the Clemson Literary Festival and our headliner is uh, Lauren Groff. Um, oh, yeah. She's this year, she'll be, she'll be coming in March, March 31st. Um, uh, and her new novel, uh, Matrix, just right. came out and I'm reading that as well. Um, a handful of other things. I'm reading Poetry Magazine always and... Uh, um, and all my go-tos, but those are the two that I've been reading heavily right now. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reading that one. Um, Sam, what are you reading? We lost you again. I think you're muted. Yeah, there you go. Sorry. Um, mostly I just, I get several feeds every morning. You know, I get the Rattle and Poetry Foundation, Poetry Daily, and a few others that are more regional. And um, I try to read, just stay current, just keep the edge and see what, what is what is being uh, promoted now. And uh, yeah. I always enjoy that. I always read that, read those before I start writing in the morning. And, um, you know, kind of just hones my focus a little bit. Play a little Hendrix, read some contemporary <laughs> poets. Yeah, <laughs> I can dig it. Yeah, it's cool. Um, Al, what about you? What are you reading? I read... Uh... Now, aside from what comes up online, but I read uh, two or three magazines fairly regularly. I think Sun Magazine is just a wonderful magazine. And then uh, I get the New Yorker. And uh, in there, you're introduced to more contemporary poets that because they seem to uh, focus on contemporary poets. And, and then I usually am reading three or four things at once. I used to, you know, pick something up and just boom through it, whether it was a novel or poetry or whatever. And lately, I've just been reading sections. So what I have right now that I'm looking at and reading is a book called Social Action. And uh, I read a little section uh, every day. I'm reading uh, a book of poetry that just came out by Helen Lose, L-O-S-S-E, from Main Street Rag. Um, she has a different perspective on life than I do. She's more traditional Catholic. Um, I'm not Catholic at all, but, uh, and she writes from that perspective. And then, uh, lately I've been going back and looking at stuff from, uh, Ann Sexton and Emily and, and, uh, uh, Whitman. Whitman just always seems to inspire me. And then this book, I can't, I, I've read through it all the way three or four times. It's by Joy Hario. And it just never seems to inspire me. You, you read something and all of a sudden there's a line or a way in which she's looking at things that really inspires me. And then there's a new book out. I think she's the poet laureate of West Virginia. Uh, she's a professor. But this book by uh, Esperanza Snyder, um, Esperanza and Hope. Hope is one of her middle names. Uh, it's an excellent book of poetry. So th that's what I'm reading right now. And I, 
I try not to read more than one or two poems from either writer at any at any one sitting because I want to absorb that that what they've written. And if you just start going from page to page, you know each po each poem has its own life, and uh, it's hard to not get lost in the crowd if you read a whole book at once. Yeah, some great recommendations there. And I've, when you mentioned Anne Sexton, I feel like every time I read her, it's like it's, um, it's brand new again. Like every time it just sort of punches you in the face and, you know, it doesn't ever feel familiar. So I like uh, collections I can return to like that also. We do have another question for the group um, from, from Bill Epps. Um, he asks, boomers all, can you speak to generational influences and differences from your colleagues and students? How you bridge those differences in your work and teaching? And since uh, Sam had a Kennedy poem, I'm going to start with him. Um, can you talk about that generational influences, differences from your colleagues, and maybe these contemporary poems you read? Is that a question? To That's me? for you, Sam. Yeah. Would you say it one more time? I... Yeah. So, um, can you talk about generational influences and oh. differences from maybe the, your colleagues and students if you teach, and maybe those contemporary poets you talked about reading? Right. Earlier. I'm, I'm not. I'm not a teacher. Okay. I never, never heard of a teacher. And um, my wife was, but she. Uh, uh, I. I have uh, three crit groups that I'm in, and they're all. I'd say they're all just about uh, you know gray hairs. You know, but you know, I have a uh, other. Uh, I like to go to the poetry open mics and hear the different type of stuff that's a little bit more contemporary cutting edge than, than what I write. You know, you've heard mine. That's essentially the, that's essentially the style I write in. And uh, I'll vary from, you know, from time to time. But, uh, you know, I, I, I probably should get out more. But, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's it keeps me busy just doing that. Well, I, I like that you have this collection kind of focused on your trip to England. So maybe you just need to visit more countries and there'll just be a new collection. Every time. Well, I keep, I, you know, it, it was a departure for me to a, a travel, you know, a journal like that. You know, right. the rest of the time I seem to be writing the same poem over and over and over and over. And over. So uh, each morning I just start over. So. One of my mentors says that, that the poet is always writing the same poem. So I mm -hmm. think there's some, there's some truth to that. Um, John, talk a little bit about generational influences. And I know you do teach how you bridge differences with your colleagues and students. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm not sure I know the I'm not sure I understand the question quite, but I I think um, if I could say this, I mean, the, the biggest influence for me, um, I I went to school to be a marine biologist. Um, I was trying to be Jacques Cousteau, so I didn't. Uh, he was a huge influence on my life, um, and at some point I got sidetracked, and it, I would blame that on Bob Dylan. Hmm. Um, I know that there was a lot of conversation when Bob Dylan won the uh, Nobel. Uh, uh, for literature, is it lo literature? Is it not literature? I don't know if it's literature, but it's sure as hell what led me to poetry. Um, so that, that I feel he's a huge influence on my life. Uh, um, I uh, just listening to Dylan's lyrics for so many years uh, uh, led me to Allen Ginsberg, led me to Whitman, led me to you know just open the door to such a a universe. I mean, I, I literally changed my whole trajectory of my life. Um, because I wanted to do that. I just wanted to be a part of that, that conversation. It just seems so much more interesting. Um, I, as, as far as keeping up with the, you know, the Joneses and my, and my students who are getting younger as I get older and older, um, I don't know, I, wor I work pretty hard to do it. I, I think we, the rest of the people were not privy to this, but my wife teaches at um, the uh, Fine Arts Center here in Greenville. So she teaches with high school kids. Um, in creative writing as well. And um, I don't know, I think between the, the two of us and we have a 10 uh, year old and an eight year old, we uh, have a vast array of things that are always influencing us. And I'm trying to always be open to whatever is new. Um, I try to listen to the kids when they're talking at school. I call them kids, I guess I should say students, when they're talking about anything, including music, which most of which I find to be bad, but I'm sure most of which they think of mine is also bad. But I feel like, uh, you know, in some ways I can't, you know, I mean, to go back to what Sam said, I feel like I pick up little 
little nuggets here every once in a while. There's a few students you start to recognize that the the uh, the use of a new generation. It's like that's who I would be if I was in. I think of that sometimes. That kid is me um, in the in the future. Um, and so yeah, I don't. I, I'm not sure I know the right answer to that question, but but I yeah. Bob Just Dylan. try to be a sponge, and there's nothing like having kids to remind you about how unhip you are. So I think that's yeah. Right, That's a good, right. humbling life experience. Um, Al, how about you? Generational influences on your work and then how you kind of bridge differences with... Well, I was world. always a social activist, very involved in the anti-war movement and, and civil rights. So there's a lot that's flowing through me on that. But I think when, when you write, you have to be authentically yourself and write, and try not to be who you're not when you write. So what it what you experience and how it, it comes to you and how it relates to the experiences you've had in your life is what you should be writing. As far as younger folks, you know, for 10 years before COVID, I hosted a weekly open mic. So I saw a lot of young folks coming through. Mm. And I think the most important thing is, one, don't be judgmental about what you think or th is, is or isn't poetry or is or isn't good. And you need to listen. So, and outside of that, when I would have, you know, because always at my open mic, I'd have a feature. And I did some monthly events with features. Um, I tried to always step outside my comfort zone. And, you know, you, you know what's being published in periodicals and you know what you're hearing in open mics. And a lot of times I would reach out and try to grab someone to bring them in that maybe they're not my cup of tea when it comes to their, their poetry or their music or whatever. But if you don't step outside your comfort zone, the world will pass you by. Right. You can't grow. Yes. Right. Yes. Well, I want to thank you guys so much. It was a fantastic reading and thanks for sticking in with us with some technical difficulties, but Sam, Al, and John, thank you so much. I'm going to close this out, but I thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. It's good thank to be you. here. Thank and you. I hope I have a chance in the future to see you guys in, in person. Yeah, Most definitely. That's, definitely. What, that's what we're all looking forward to. <laughs> thank you guys. All see right. you guys. Bye-bye. So I want to thank you again for joining Carolina Poets uh, Poetry Goes Live. Um, this reading is hosted and, and simulcasted on the Facebook page for Carolina Poets and the YouTube channel. So you can check us out on either of those uh, venues. Also, all of our historical readings are on the YouTube channel and or the Facebook page. So if you want to go back and check out any in our series, please do that. We host readings on the second and fourth Thursday of each month and we feature established poets and emerging voices. I'd like to thank each of our readers for their participation tonight. And please check out the links that are in the chat for each of the readers by the art that moves you. And I thank you all so much for joining us. Have a good night.